Hello, listeners. This is Mike, your host. If you are enjoying these archive episodes, please consider supporting the podcast by going to the homepage, spacerockethistory.com, and clicking on the orange Donate button or the Patreon link. Hopefully, with your support, I can continue to release these archive episodes. Thanks. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Godspeed, John Glenn. Roger, zero G, and I feel fine. Can I feel out? Okay, I'm out. How does it feel for the United States to be the new record holder? At last, huh? When that baby light, there's no doubt about it. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. Hello and welcome. This is Michael Annis, and you're listening to episode 171 of the Space Rocket History Podcast. And now, Apollo 8, The Reaction. We left off last week, just after Apollo 8 had returned to Earth. Back in Houston, in Mission Control, there was pandemonium. People waved miniature American flags and slapped one another on the back. The traditional cigars were broken out and everyone lighted up. None of Mission Control worries had materialized. All of their fears had been groundless. Their planning had been sound. Their simulations accurate. Their estimates precise. Mission Control could have destroyed Apollo 8 in a thousand different ways, but instead they had nurtured and guided it through the most far-ranging week in the history of man. Mike Collins was part of that celebration in Mission Control. He served as Capcom for the Green Team during the flight, and he would have been Apollo 8's command module pilot, except he was temporarily grounded after back surgery, and Jim Lovell took his place. This was his reaction to Apollo 8's success from his viewpoint in Mission Control. Quote, For me personally, the moment was a conglomeration of emotions and memories. I was a basket case, emotionally wrung out. I had seen this flight evolve in the White Room at Downey in the interminable series of meetings at Houston. And it evolved into an epic voyage. I had helped it grow. I had two years invested in it. It was my flight. Yet it was not my flight. I was but one of a hundred packed into a noisy room. I could wave my flag and smoke my cigar and finger the scar on my throat. But that was about all. For some reason, I felt like crying. But I couldn't do that in mission control. So I clapped a few good working troops on the back and left, end quote. A longtime advocate of the space program, President Lyndon Johnson, called the astronauts shortly after their recovery. Here's the clip. We want to welcome you home. We thank God that you're back safe again. You've made us very proud to be alive at this particular moment in history. You made us feel akin to those Europeans uh, nearly five centuries ago who heard stories of the new world for the first time. There's just no other comparison that we can make that's equal to what you've done or to what we feel. America's space achievements, said NASA's retiring director James Webb, was the lengthened shadow of President Johnson, who since his Senate days had led the historic effort to explore the frontiers of space. In Washington, on January 9, 1969, Borman, Lovell, and Anders visited the White House, where President Johnson presented them with NASA's Distinguished Service Medal. Then their motorcade passed through the cheering crowds on its way to Capitol Hill, 
where a joint session of Congress and the Supreme Court heard Borman's report. The theme of his talk was that Apollo 8 was a triumph of all mankind. Then the three astronauts went to the Department of State Auditorium for a press conference to describe their trip and answer questions from the news media. New York City welcomed them with a ticker tape parade on the 10th of January. Newark hailed them on the 11th, and Miami greeted them on the 12th during the Super Bowl. The astronauts returned to Houston on the 13th for a hometown parade. Incoming President Richard Nixon sent Borman and his family on an eight-nation goodwill tour of Western Europe. They visited London, Paris, Brussels, The Hague, Bonn, Berlin, Rome, Madrid, and Lisbon. Everywhere they went, the astronauts depicted the Earth as a spaceship and stressed international cooperation in space. Here's a clip describing the world reaction to Apollo 8. A courageous event, said the Russians. The Vatican called it daring, incredible. Britain's astronomer Sir Bernard Lovell, who earlier had questioned its scientific value, now called it one of the historic moments in the development of the human race. From Paris, the supreme compliment. Magnifique. Formidable. Now, here's a clip of Frank Borman with his recollection of world reaction to Apollo 8. Well, after the flight, I was... I was, uh, I had, that was my last flight, and, I, and uh, Jim and Bill were so busy, so I was sent over to Europe, and, and then the Soviets invited us to go through, through Russia, and uh, we found nothing but friendship and, uh, and uh, the same kind of acclaim that we got here in the United States. I, I, and uh, it was a, uh, another gratifying experience to be able to represent the country when everybody was so proud of it, um, not just Americans, but everybody. Now I have the reaction of an astronaut contemporary. These are the words of future moonwalker Dave Scott from his book, Two Sides of the Moon. Quote, A first, we had sent men into orbit around the moon. This was a huge accomplishment. In a sense, we had won the race. But in retrospect, we know now that the race was very, very close, especially during the autumn of 1968. Some of our engineers who worked on lunar trajectories tacked some informal notes on their boards that indicated a Soviet launch window to the moon in early December, three weeks before the scheduled launch of Apollo 8. Few others paid much attention or were aware of this. Others were aware that in September, just a month before Apollo 7, a Soviet Zond 5 spacecraft had flown around the moon but was only partly successful upon its return to Earth. The Zond was a Soyuz manned spacecraft modified for a lunar mission. Then, on November 10th, Zond 6 flew around the moon, unmanned, and returned to Earth, capturing a dramatic view of Earth rise from the moon. And a few in NASA probably knew that the next Zond spacecraft was on the pad ready for launch during that early December window. But for several reasons, it was not launched. If a Soviet Zond crew had returned high quality photos of the Earth from the moon three weeks before Apollo, the balance of the race could very well have changed. Dramatically, end quote. And what were the accomplishments that Dave Scott was talking about? I have them here. Apollo 8 was the first manned flight of the Saturn V. It was the first manned vehicle to leave the Earth's gravitational field. It was the first use of a computer that combined with the navigation and guidance system provided total onboard autonomy in inertial space. It was the first manned vehicle in lunar orbit. It allowed man his first and closest naked eye view of another world. 
It was man's first exposure to solar radiation beyond the Earth's magnetic field. It was the first vehicle to rocket out of lunar orbit, and it was the first manned vehicle to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere from another world. And there was an unexpected accomplishment to this near-perfect Apollo 8 mission. For years, Mission Control had joked with the recovery team to stay away from the landing point or else they would hit the aircraft carrier. Well, as the guidance system performance improved, this actually became a possibility. The trench did such a good job for Apollo 8 that Bill Tyndall dispatched a letter to the head of the recovery division. Here's a quote from it. Jerry, I've done a lot of joking about this spacecraft hitting the carrier, but the more I think about it, the less I feel it is a joke. The visual reports of the landing indicated the spacecraft flew right over the carrier and landed only 4,572 meters away. This really strikes me as too close. The consequences of hitting the carrier would be catastrophic. I seriously recommend that you relocate the recovery forces at least 8 to 16 kilometers from the target point. End quote. Now let's consider the Soviet reaction to Apollo 8. First, I have the cosmonaut Alexei Leonov, the first man to walk in space. This is a quote from his book, Two Sides of the Moon. Quote, After the successes of Zon 5 and Soyuz 3, many of us cosmonauts were pushing for the next flight to be a manned circumlunar mission. Media reports from the United States confirmed that NASA was planning its first circumlunar mission at the end of 1968, but instead, Chief Designer Mission launched another unmanned mission, Zond 6, in November. Again, the spacecraft passed around the far side of the moon, taking unique pictures of previously hidden portions of the lunar surface, but again, the capsule experienced a problem on re-entry. Plans for a manned circumlunar mission were once again postponed. I was in Moscow, busy working on our L-1 circumlunar program, when the news came through that the Americans had sent a manned spacecraft into orbit around the moon. News of the Apollo 8 mission was everywhere, on television, on the radio, in the newspaper. I suddenly had the feeling that everything was slipping through my fingers. I could see my dreams going up in smoke. It felt as if everything I had been preparing for so hard over the past few years had been a waste. I was filled with a deep apprehension that they might cancel our circumlunar program. Still, I admired the way Apollo 8 had accomplished its mission. It was brilliant. There was no denying that. This was officially recognized by our political leaders when Frank Borman became the first astronaut to be formally invited to visit our country. A big party was thrown in his honor at Moscow's Metropole Restaurant. The place was so crowded you could hardly push your way through the people. Some men were there in military uniform. Some had come straight from work. Borman, by contrast, wore a dark jacket and a white shirt. Instead of a necktie, he wore a thin string like a cowboy's tied with a bright blue stone in the middle. He cut a very striking figure. Everyone wanted to stand near him, to touch him. When I eventually met him, I congratulated him on his mission. I, of all people, I said, knew how hard it must have been. I did not tell him that I, too, had been training for a circumlunar mission, but I felt as if he knew that already. Borman was very gracious. He congratulated me on my spacewalk with Foscod 2. We began to talk about how the moon had looked when he was in orbit. We discussed good locations for lunar landings. Then Borman was called upon to make a speech. He proposed several toasts 
to future cooperation in space between our two countries, a desire I shared. He was very polite and very tactful. He tried to answer all the questions that were put to him, after which he was presented with a Tula gun. His wife Susan, dressed all in blue, then stood up and said she wanted to offer a personal gift of her own. She removed from her finger a ring with a big turquoise stone at its center and handed it to Georgi Beregovoy, who had been promoted to a senior position in the Cosmonaut Corps after his Soyuz 3 mission. Everyone stood up and applauded this gesture of goodwill. We had been looking at each other as enemies for so long, we had hardly ever met American astronauts face to face. But when such meetings did take place, we had the feeling that they were just the same. That, like us, the American astronauts had their joys and sorrows. End quote. So it appears the official Soviet reaction was congratulatory. But what was the behind-the-scenes reaction? To determine this, we look to OKB-1's Deputy Chief Designer, Boris Chertok. I have some excerpts from his book, Rockets and People. Quote, On December 28th, ministry leaders and our small group on the special list were granted the opportunity to watch the splashdown of Apollo 8, which had lifted off on December 21st. From our point of view, this event stole the thunder from our lunar program. By the very fact that it was a piloted lunar orbital flight, and it was the first instance of using the Saturn V rocket to launch a piloted vehicle, we received the broadcast via the Eurovision channel. It did not go over the airways, but was transmitted via cable to us. When the crew capsule entered the atmosphere, it passed over Siberia and China and splashed down in the Pacific Ocean six kilometers from the pre-calculated position where the aircraft carrier Yorktown was located. The splashdown, the search, the approach of the rescue boats, the placement of the pontoons under the spacecraft, the approach of the helicopters, and the evacuation and transportation of the crew to the aircraft carrier took just an hour and a half. Judging by the television pictures, the astronauts were delivered on board the carrier in good health. Besides the subsequent landing expeditions to the moon, the flight of Apollo 8 was the greatest success in the entire history of American astronautics showing the whole world that the U.S. had finally managed to overtake the Soviet Union in space. Chertok continues, On December 30th, at the demand of Minister Ustinov, the Military Industrial Commission of the Soviet Union held an emergency session to discuss just one issue. How can we respond to the Americans? The meeting began with a review of what should have happened already. A vehicle launched by the UR-500K rocket was supposed to execute a circumlunar flight in the first half of 1967. Comrade Chalomi of OKB-52 was named prime contractor. A landing of a crew on the surface of the moon from a vehicle inserted by the N-1 heavy launch vehicle and the crew's return and landing on Earth was supposed to have happened sometime in 1967 or 68. The prime contractor for this launch vehicle, the spacecraft, and the expedition as a whole was OKB-1, Chief Designer Korolev, later Chief Designer Mission. These projects had remained crucial for the entire space industry over the last three years. The first launches of the 7K L1 vehicles for circumlunar flight took place in March 1967. Since then, nine unpiloted 7K L1 vehicles had been launched using the UR-500K launch vehicle. However, either through fault of the launch vehicle or of the spacecraft systems, a decision could not yet be made 
to go ahead with a manned flight. Flight tests on the N-1 launch vehicle had not even begun. Since all these deadlines had passed, there was no more discussion on these projects. The main subject of this session was to approve the YE-85 program. This was the program to return a soil sample from the moon to the earth by an automatic unpiloted spacecraft. Back in early 1968, Babakin had told me about this idea with his inherent enthusiasm and confidence that everything would pan out and we would deliver a little lunar soil to earth just about a hundred grams before the Americans would bring back a dozen kilograms on their Apollos. The project had so many purely engineering problems that I expressed my doubt as to whether the problem could be solved in the upcoming year. Babkin's proposal seemed very bold, but it found support in the Central Committee as a backup scenario that was inexpensive. Now, having become aware of the lack of prospects for the 7KL1 and the vague deadlines for the N1L3, even Keldish spoke out in favor of accelerating the YE85 project. He said we could show that our way of studying the moon is through automatic spacecraft. We have no intention of foolishly risking human life for the sake of political sensation. So the group made a tacit decision to give this explanation to the mass media. Now, with the Soviet reaction decided by committee, let's return to the beginning and listen to the crew of Apollo 8's reaction to their successful mission as recorded in 2013. Well, uh, you know, I... I've reflected on it a lot more now than I did at that time. I, I, I think that, that the three of us were very, very fortunate Americans. 400,000 people put that thing together, 400,000 Americans. Uh, several died in it, uh, in the fire and then airplane crashes. Uh, I, I felt very, very, very blessed to be with Jim and Bill because it was, there was a wonder, wonderful camaraderie there. It's hard to tell. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm still I'm still mad about you doing that in the sauna, but nevertheless, uh, it was a it was a remarkable feeling, and, and I I can remember as I we stepped out on the carrier with that fresh ocean breeze and the flag flying there and the sailors all standing around. It was a feeling to me of overwhelming sense of gratitude for what we had been part of. Uh, you know, the three of us got all the acclaim or most of the acclaim. And, and the people that deserved it were all over, and certainly the, the giants in NASA. And most of them are, are gone now. I think Chris Kraft's the only one still alive. So, uh, and then, then down to the, to the lowest uh, janitor. And I can remember going, we went through the factories all the time. I remember going through the, uh, the autopilot factory in, at midnight. And the lady who must have weighed 300 pounds grabbed me and gave me a hug and damn near suffocated me and, and, in her bosom and said, uh, you don't worry a bit because we're doing our job. And it, that, that was a wonderful feeling. And I, I, I just um, feel very, very privileged to have been a part of it. Well, I agree with Frank. Uh, the fact that as soon as we got down, at least in my feelings, uh, I didn't realize exactly what we had accomplished. I knew that we accomplished a successful first flight to the moon. But I didn't know the significance of it uh, for the United States and for the world of what, what had happened. It, it takes time for these things to sink in. It takes a little bit of history and aging to say, hey, really what happened? How does this affect, you know, uh, our view uh, of the country? Especially as Martin had mentioned, uh, 1968 was a very poor year in this country. And then we suddenly ended that year on a positive note, doing something you know, positive for the country that everybody could take pride in. And remember, as uh, Frank has often said, Apollo 
was really not a program to explore the moon or develop technology. It was to beat the Soviets, to demonstrate uh, our technological preeminence. As he said, another battle in the Cold War. And Apollo 8 and then certainly Apollo 11 uh, underscored America's ability there and uh, basically won that battle. And in a sense, uh, great feelings about the accomplishment, but I frankly felt a little guilty because all of us had uh, comrades and colleagues doing uh, things that I thought were a lot more dangerous. Uh, fighting in Vietnam, uh, a lot of colleagues shot down, put in prison, El Dorado Canyon, raid on Libya. Uh, frankly, I think Apollo 8 was probably a lot safer. And uh, we were lucky to be part of it, as Frank said. No, I, do too. I, I agree with Ken. You, know, you stop thinking, but look at, the, at John Glenn. What, 69 missions in World War II and there's so many missions in, in Korea. And, uh, you know, if I hadn't been in, if I hadn't been in Apollo, I'd have, I would have wanted been in Vietnam. Yeah. But we weren't. And, and we sort of got all the adulation and all the success and all the plaudits. And there were so many people that were trying to serve this country under much more difficult circumstances. So I felt very humble and very grateful. I want to close this episode with Borman, Lovell, and Anders answering the question, how would they like to be remembered? Well, we made it. well l let me try to answer that. Uh, I think uh, the best thing to have Apollo 8 remembered, uh, especially by the young people growing up when they read it in the history books, is that, uh, that we can accomplish just about anything if we put our mind to it, and we get together and work as team, as a team with uh, good leadership, that there's nothing that is, quote, impossible to do uh, if, uh, if we work hard at it. I would submit that the way Apollo 8 will be remembered three or 400 years from now, first times human left the Earth, period. I'd like to be remembered as a great effort by an, by an American culture that, uh, that was free. Thanks for listening to this archive episode of the Space Rocket History Podcast. If you are financially able, please support the podcast by going to the homepage spacerockethistory.com and clicking on the orange donate button or the Patreon link. Thanks.